What's going on, everybody? Welcome into the Thursday, March 21st, 2024 edition of the Daily Energy News Beat Stand Up. Here are today's top headlines. First up, energy giants create global synthetic natural gas coalition. Interested to hear that one. Next up, Deutschland, how Germany is dominating the hydrogen market. Super interesting. Next <laughs> up, guys, red alert for the Nathan nation's electrical supply. Very interesting and interesting study that's coming out of, of the Washington Post of all places. So we'll, we'll get a crack into that. We will then cover 70% of passive ESG funds are exposed to new oil and gas products. Um, can only laugh at this one. Stu will then toss it over to me. I will quickly cover what's going on in the oil and gas markets. Touch on crude oil inventories, um, which was actually a little bit of a surprise relative to what we saw from the API. And then cover Comstock getting an investment from a majority shareholder. So, hmm. Name ring a bell, Jerry Jones. We'll talk about all that and a bag of chips, guys. Um, As always, I'm Michael Tanner, joined by Stuart Turley. Kick us off. Hey, let's get ready to rumble here, Michael. Uh, energy giants create global synthetic natural gas coalition. Huh. Yeah. Uh, I think we found us a new um, investor of the week, in, uh, investor relations guy of the week. That title of this thing is very confusing. It is E-ENG. It's supposed to be the... ESG of ENG is considered as a sustainable drop in solution for gas consumers, as it does not require the modification of industrial processes and application to be used in place of conventional. All right. That sounds pretty good, but they're looking at the, uh, we have total, uh, Jenny, uh, NG, and U.S. Sempra Infrastructure have announced plans to create the coalition and try to work with E-Natural Gas, a synthetic natural gas produced from, are you ready? Renewable hydrogen and CO2. <laughs> Here's my thing. I have no idea if this technology works, but if it does, it would ENG. It's it's a great marketing slick. You're absolutely hey. right. Whoever came up with this, we would collectively give credit to whatever marketing firm came up with that for IR Guy of the Week. Because you're right. The ENG is great. I think what's I love it. What's up? I love it. Yeah, I but mean it all about yet. hydrogen, I guess. It's not there yet. I mean, this is hilarious. The way they're bringing this coalition together, it's it's like uh, the WEF got together with the WWE and started a little rumbling match. This is a nutty thing. It, this will go in line with our next story on the energy thread, but I just found Total Energy is really pretty interesting. Uh, Miss Abichi is in here. <laughs> They'll have a sweet... Uh... This, this coalition's going to have a great fundraising campaign. They're going to raise a lot of money from sponsors. They're going to have a nice big event out there in D.C. Not much will change, though. You're right. You're right. What's next? Oh, it, it is pathetic. Let's go to Deutschland. Uh, how Germany is dominating the hydrogen market. Okay. Ener energy with Germany is kind of a bad thing right now because... Germany and California have the two highest energy costs in the world. Both are deindustrializing because of their energy policies. So let's start this. If somebody is deindustrializing and they're horrible with decisions, would you want to follow them as an energy lemming? Um, how is G Germany dominating the hydrogen market? Question mark. Uh, 10 gigawatts of electro uh, electrolyzers are predicted to produce a half a million tons of green hydrogen annually. This investment means it's set to boast more hydrogen valleys than any other country in the world. France is expected to sit in second place with four in the UK and the Netherlands are supposed to have two apiece. It doesn't work. Um, I almost want to do my Biden imitation. Le I'm leaning into the mic. It doesn't work. Um, where's their water? 
hydrogen takes a lot of water, no matter what process. This is part of the great EU hydrogen corridor that you cannot put these things into a normal pipeline. They say that you can put them in natural gas, and I was big on this. It doesn't work. It has to be all new pipelines. The cost is prohibitive. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I, you're absolutely right. It's, I mean, tangible. there's funding available for it. So people are going to create projects to, to do with that. I do love they're in this, this hydrogen corridor. I found that super interesting. Um, now in, 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 in Germany's defense, they are one of the final high quality manufacturing countries in the world. High precision tools, their man, their 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 steel they manufacturing is one of the best in the world. So if they anybody's were. gonna they were. The operative word is were. Okay. Most high tech folks are leaving and they have quit investing in new technology in Germany. Okay. Word were okay. I mean, I still don't think it's going to work, but if they have, if <laughs> <laughs> you can't get a word in with him, I think, in my opinion, you know, you got to try. Now, is this a little bit of just a government grab to, 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 to funnel some money to some other bureaucrats? Well, probably, but they are actually trying to make it happen again. Is it going to work? I don't know, but I'm all for private industry doing this like BMW it goes down to talk about how uh, BMW is looking and how much they're spending on trying to get a hydrogen car. Rent. I'm all for private industry doing this because that's yes. the efficient market playing. Yep. I agree. I, I love having profits from companies supported by the markets, get the energy. And we'll see. We'll see, I, just like we're seeing with wind and so we'll see if it rains supreme. Oh, yeah. Let's spend some more money. Taxpayers got all of it to give away. Okay, let's well, go to again, the next one. I'm for here. private industry. Oh, that's I'm not saying. for public spending. There's a difference. A huge difference. Red alert for the nation's electric supply. This is pretty funny. It comes out of the Washington Post, ran a front page article March 10th titled Amid Explosive Demand, America's Running Out of Power. <laughs> Michael, what's driving a lot of the new demand? Well, it, the, the, there's so much. There's AI, there's data centers, there's so much driving new energy consumption. It's as what is the ex, what did Mar Washington Post say? Amid explosive demand. Ooh, that right. just that's that that you know, when I think of explosive, I don't think of demand. I think of something else. Yep. Uh, it, it, ooh. Uh, okay, I, I went there. That was horrible. I just I've got to go get mental floss now. <laughs> the, down later, lower down in the article here, it says that more than sixty percent of data centers are expected to locate in Miso, uh, Caso, mostly in California, PJM and. Uh, neither Mizzo or Casio appear to have included substantial data center growth in their forecast. <laughs> <laughs> that'll, that'll get y'all wrong. Uh, Pennsylvania is going through the AI data center pain right now. We just, we covered some of these stories in the last few weeks. There's not enough energy in these big data centers. In fact, uh, Facebook is putting one in and there's not enough power to even support it. What's he going to do? Flap no. his gums and give a speech in there to power it? I don't know. No, there's no way. All right, what's next? Let's go to 70% of passive ESG funds are exposed to the new oil and gas projects. Investing hypocrisy is seeing light at the end of the tunnel. A total of 70% of passive funds passed off as sustainable by five of the largest asset managers in the U.S. and Europe are exposed to companies developing new oil and gas projects. It's pretty funny. Um, 
we saw this with BlackRock last year sneaking in pipelines that they had actually owned in the Middle East and kept hidden on their balance sheet. Now, uh, Texas just shut down the $8 billion that they are investing. Texas is investing out of Black in BlackRock, Rock. Rock, and they've shut that down today, and it is now out. So um, it was yesterday, I believe. Uh, here's a quote. Um, the authors of the Reclaim Finances report wrote, the analyst also shows that uh, especially when these funds are invested in bonds, they provide direct financing for fossil fuel developers. Well, uh, well, I think what's what, what's interesting is so they 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 took 430 quote sustainable passive funds managed by the five largest fund managers. You've got um, Legal and General Investments, ABS Investments, BlackRock, DWS, and Abdati. And 70% of the 430 funds were exposed to companies that are actually developing uh, fossil fuel projects. Not all, you know, some of the biggest is Total Energies, which you could argue was trying to go ESG, but it really hasn't. We just saw that yesterday with the non op deal, Shell, Exxon. But get this also, coal developers like Glencore, you know, who's, you know, which I'm all for. Again, make coal great again. I'm, I'm all for it. Um, did you just say coal? I did. Oh man, don't you know that now? You, oh no, I there's pow, 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 pow. There's all those left wing nut job heads going off right now. Pow, pow, pow. Karen, yeah, is so, going, the, the, wait, so your this sister is Karen, ESG this is fund Karen is investing calling the podcast right Gordon. now. Karen, no. <laughs> Sorry, it's crazy. It's crazy. All right, man, off to you now. Yeah, um, we'll we'll quickly cover here what's going on oil and gas finance, guys. But but first, we'll go ahead and, and pay the bills or attempt to. After that, uh, <laughs> we appreciate everybody again who tunes in. Thanks for again. All this stuff is brought to you by energynewsbeat.com, the best place for all of your energy and oil and gas news. Stu and the team do a tremendous job making sure that website stays up to speed. Everything you need to know to be at the tip of the spear when it comes to the energy business. Uh, check out the description below for all the timestamps, links to the different articles. Um, and check out uh, the survey we have running below. You can also hit us at dashboard.energynewsbeat.com, which is the best place for all your data news combo. Better get that while you still can because... Uh, you never know where it might go. Again, energynewsbeat.com. I mean, really, when we look, Stu, at the, at the overall markets today, we saw the S&P 500 up about eight-tenths of a percentage point. NASDAQ trades up about 1.15 percentage points, mainly off the back of Indivia, continuing to just absolutely carry the economy. Uh, the memes are absolutely insane. Dollar index down about half a percentage point. Bitcoin with a little bit of a rebound up to $67,000 today. That's up about nine percentage points in a 24-hour span. Crude oil has you know, basically stayed flat, 81.50, 86.36 for Brent. Um, natural gas trading at $1.70. I thought we had a, a, a couple issues. We've got, you know, um, you know, the feds came out today and decided to hold U.S. interest rates steady. Um, you, you know, that was a talk that they were going to cut. They've already we've projected a few cuts in. They didn't raise. They held firm. So that guidance didn't necessarily do more or less for oil. It kind of held it flat. We did see an expected two million barrel draw from the EIA crude oil petroleum reserves. Um, it was two, again two million, um, and the current levels are sitting at four hundred and forty-five. Uh, 445 million barrels of crude oil inventories, about 3% below that five-year average. We also saw total motor gasoline inventories decrease by 3.3 million um, and are about 2% below the five-year average. Um, we also saw um, refinery output uh, average about 15.8 million barrels per day for the week, um, which was about 125,000 barrels more than the previous week. You're sitting at about an 80 7.9% refinery capacity. So there's a little bit of wiggle room to grow up there, but we're starting to get get up there. You know, I really think there's 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 only one thing I saw. And this came across late, Stu. This was a late waiver wire. Comstock Resources announces $100.5 million investment by majority shareholder 
Um, Comstock Resources out of Frisco there announces that its majority shareholder, our friend Jerry Jones, not really a friend, I don't know why I said that, but um, has agreed to make a $100.45 million equity investment into the company through multiple entities that he controls. He's going to acquire about 12.5 million shares of common stock in a private placement um, at about $8 a share, which represents the average closing price for the five uh, trading days leading up to that. Um, he's going to remember he's going to own about 67% of the company's shares outstanding um, after this um, commitment is done up from 65. So he's buying about 2% of the company for $100 million, which is kind of crazy to think about it. You know, 2% for $100 million. It's a good deal. It's a good deal for Comstock. You better, you're lucky your own. I mean, it's Jerry buying his own stuff, but it's a little crazy to think about, you know, the, the that valuation there. Um, they came out and said they're going to use the proceeds from the equity investment to pay down bank debt, which was partially incurred to fund uh, uh, their most recent acquisitions, um, which is a bunch of Western Hainesville stuff for about $58 million from a variety of people. So um, nothing like buying low and se- or uh, selling low and buying high. Got to love it. Buying natural gas um, assets and then they tank on you. That's got to suck. But good for Jerry. I mean, will this work out? Only time will tell. Um, I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb and say Comstock's probably in rough shape if they're needing to go one hundred million dollars to Jerry and he's willing to only do that for two percent. I mean, that's yikes. You know what I mean? I wonder uh, how that transaction is going to happen if he's investing in getting a tax deduction, because if it's a public company, you're not able to take some of that deduction off. It's these two entities that he controls. So it'd be interesting what these entities are. They're not businesses. They're probably they're You, you, you wonder if it's a way to if it's, you know, obviously he's making the majority of his money from the Dallas Cowboys. So the question is, is this are these entities the 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 vehicles in which the distributions from the NFL are being distributed into these entities? And in order to make those investments liquid, he trades them out for stock at a crazy valuation so that he can then take those shares and get a loan off of them. So he's liquid. I don't know. Maybe that's what it is. If it is, that goes back to like the oxy eva deal eval we were looking to you look under the hood or used to under the skirt when I was in college, you know, you'd say, hey, what's going on? Well, I mean, this is a it's one it's an issue with being asset heavy and cash light is you have to figure out a way to access your equity in forms of cash. And a lot of what these high net worth people do is they. They acquire stock, and instead of it's like, why is Elon Musk have a net worth of a hundred billion? He doesn't have a hundred billion in cash. He has stock worth this, so he goes out and he uses his stock as collateral and gets very low interest rate loans for a billion dollars. And now he's got cash. He still owns the stock, but it's collateralized back. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting player. Don't know what's going in here, but Jerry Jones another hundred million into Comstock. So uh, you drill, baby, drill. We gotta love it. Gotta go. What else you need? Oh, not much. We just released uh, Doomberg yesterday. Uh, Doomberg and Chris Wright. Yes. And we talked about Liberty's humanitarian efforts with energy. We talked about Doomberg's uh, leadership in finance and energy. It was a fantastic discussion. Yes, check that out on energynewsbeat.com. We'll make sure that's sitting on the top news and the and and the 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 EMB publishers picks. We always appreciate all the and feedback. Thank you, Chris Wright and Doomberg. We love them. We, we love them. And tomorrow is Robert Bryce. Yes. We love us Robert, Robert Bryce, Bryce tomorrow. Love Robert Bryce. All right. Yeah, absolutely. Um Yes, so you'll get Robert Bryce tomorrow. You'll hear the weekly recap on Saturday, and we will be back in the saddle on Monday. Um, We'll probably drop a podcast, just an interview. You got somebody to drop on Sunday? I do. I do. Let me look. Let me look. Give me a second. Look at the production calendar. I'm looking at production. We have Irina Slav on deck. This one's going to be pretty good. And then we also have Gifford Briggs, Gulf Coast Director for the API. And then we have JT coming around the corner. You talked with JT. I'm talking with JT. I've got two spotlights that I'm about to record 
um, one being on the court Interplus merger, and then another one specifically on um, the EQT Equitrans. We're bringing in JT. He's a um, a recent friend of the show, but we've gotten to know each other a little bit. He's a midstream MA guy. He's gonna kind of talk us through what this all means. He's a big fan of Toby Rice, so um I'm sure he'll he'll love this deal, but it'll be interesting because that stock price doesn't look good. But with that, guys, <laughs> we're gonna let you get out of here. Uh, appreciate you checking us out. As always, you'll check out Robert Rice tomorrow on the podcast. Check out the weekly recap on Saturday, and we will see you back on Monday. Have a great weekend, folks. Thank <laughs> you.